All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Nitha Ramachandra from the NR Hour Sports Show. This is big episode 900 for our show. Uh, we're joined by a really special guest. His name is Stuart Schweiger. He's a former NFL safety. He went to Purdue for college. He played for the Oakland Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders. He played for the Washington football team, New York Giants, Detroit Lions, Omaha Nighthawks, which is the UFL League, which we'll get to. And now he, he used to be a coach, too. He's a coach uh, in 2015, a, a big-time coach who – Sewer, I just want to say thank you for joining the show. It's truly an honor. And how are you and your family doing? Thank you. Nathan, I want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, anytime I can get out and, and uh, speak to um, fans or just general people who like sports, I like to be able to get in front of them and, and give them an inside look on how it really is. And, um, you know, the, 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 the inside look of it. Um, so anytime I can get in front of the camera, I always enjoy it. And the family, the family's doing very well. As we were just talking, you asked where I'm, uh, where I'm at. I, I moved back to West Lafayette, Indiana, about four years ago, where Purdue University is. Uh, originally from Michigan. Uh, after I was done playing, we lived in Michigan, uh, and I started having a family. And uh, the economy up there in Saginaw. So you have Saginaw, Flint, and Detroit all on I-75, and there's just nothing up there and I wanted the best opportunity for my kids. And we came down here and we've enjoyed it very, very much. And, um, we, we couldn't be happier to be in this location. It's awesome. Well, so obviously you, you grew up, I want to start off with your childhood growing up, you grew up in Michigan and what was it like growing up as a kid in Michigan? And when did you start getting into sports and, uh, before playing, before choosing football, did you get to play any other sports growing up? Um, Good questions. Um, so um, I'm, I come from a pretty big family. My, I have two older brothers. I have two older sisters. Um, they actually had a different father than me. Their father was John Canelli. Um, my mother divorced him and, and then he passed away. Huh. Then she married my father. Uh, he's actually big Stu and I'm little Stu. Huh. Um, they, they married, had me. Then they got divorced, and then my father remarried oh. uh, to a woman named Leanne who had um, two daughters and a son. So I had two older stepsisters, a younger stepdaughter, and then they had a daughter between them. So they have my little sister, Haley, who's uh, 24 or 25. So um, I grew up in a big family, but the, my older siblings were kind of gone I mean my closest sibling to me was was my sister Jenny and she's nine years older than me my oldest at the time uh when I was born she was so she's 17 older 17 years older than me so really I, I have a big family but I was almost a, a, a single child um once my parents got divorced um you know my mother worked so where I'm from it's a very blue collar town um you know I mean it's it's, you know, people go to work and, you know, and you, you see a, a church, liquor store, bar, church, liquor store, bar. I mean, um, it's a great town to grow up in. Um, my father was a deputy sheriff for 26 years in Saginaw County. Oh, wow. uh, he also owned Old Town Gym and Equipment uh, for 31 years, which, so I grew up, so, I, so my father uh, played uh, college football. He's from South Dakota. And he played college football uh, at a small school in South Dakota called Yankton College. And actually now it's, it's been since retired and now it's a prison actually. But um, my dad, so there's a guy named Lyle Lizado. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's a player that played for Denver and a great player for the Raiders, ended up passing away. Uh, but he played defensive end. And when he got drafted, my father came in and played defensive end in his position uh, my, my two older brothers played uh, Division II football at a university called Northwood up in the Saginaw Bay Area. Uh, my sister uh, was a gymnast. My other sister was uh, a swimmer. So I come from an athletic family, and growing up, I played everything. I started off in gymnastics. I was a gymnast for the first 10 years of my life. And actually, I've been putting up videos, and if you go on my, my, um, my YouTube page, I actually have some of my gymnastics stuff on there. So for 10 years, I did gymnastics, which – was great for flexibility and core strength. Uh, I did, I did soccer, uh, baseball up until eighth grade. Uh, I did in fifth and sixth grade. I did Taekwondo. I was actually the, oh, wow. um, I went to the junior Olympics. I finished second in the junior Olympics in Taekwondo. 
Um, and then uh, let's see, let's see. So soccer, uh, gymnastics, taekwondo, baseball. Uh, and then fourth grade, I started football. Uh, I also started basketball in fourth grade. Uh, once I got to eighth grade, uh, I actually, when I went into high school, I actually switched from baseball to track and field. So in high school, I was a, a football, basketball, and track. And actually growing up, I was more of a basketball player. Um, I thought I had a, a future in basketball probably before I did in football. Um, but my parents never forced me to play any sports. I wasn't a big fan of sports. I didn't know, you know, my brothers always wanted to watch Michigan or Michigan State and the Detroit Lions. And Barry Sanders was my favorite player. And I, I liked I liked Michigan uh, growing up a little bit, but I, I didn't sit there and watch the games. Um, so I just kind of played the sports, you know, and my parents always said, you know, if, if you're in the sport, you're going to finish it out after the season. If you don't want to do it, you, you know, we, we won't do it. You know, you can you can quit that sport or not do that sport. So I, I, again, I never, I never, I was never forced to do sports, but, you know, again, growing up in, Sa in Saginaw, all my friends came from broken families. So really during the day, man, we were, we were out, we were out playing football, basketball, uh, tag, riding our bikes. I mean, we were constantly every day, just constantly competing against each other. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I, at an early age, I knew that competitive feeling. I mean, we were constantly battling each other. So uh, it's a tough town. It's a great town. A lot of great athletes have come out of that area. And I'm very fortunate to uh, have lived in that area. Well, yeah. So speaking of uh, those athletes and a lot of great talent coming out from Michigan. And do you have like any role models that you looked up to growing up? But, uh, well, again, I, I didn't, I mean, I liked Barry Sanders. Yeah, right. uh, my favorite player uh, of all time would be Dan Marley, oh, who's yeah. from Traverse City, Michigan, played at Central Michigan. The reason I wear number nine was that was his number in the pros. Right. So, again, I thought I was more of a basketball guy. Uh, so I, I, I liked those guys. But I, I would say, you know, my parents, my, my father, my two brothers, uh, really my sisters and my mom. I mean, I had I really had three dads and three moms because my brothers were so much older and sisters were so much older. Uh, they're almost like parents, you know, so as role models, I just, I, 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 I kind of followed in their footsteps and, and learned from them. And my father, you know, he'd take me in the jail and all, you know, all the inmates respected him. And they always, everyone was, you know, stew, 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 stew. And, and my father always told me, it doesn't matter if, if you're the, the, the janitor or the, the man who runs the share or who, who runs the, the county jail you treat everybody with respect. Right. And the gym that he had was an old school gym, man. I mean, he made half the equipment. It was power lifting. Uh, I, again, I, I grew, I mean, one years old, I'm walking around. I, I thought, I thought that's how everybody lifted and, and worked out and sweated and yelled. And, um, half, half the gym membership was by my dad's, uh, deputy sheriffs and the other half were inmates that had gotten out. And so I, I grew up around a very multicultural uh, um, a, a group of people, you know, Hispanic, African-American, whites, and, you know, different religions, guys who had served 10, 15 years in jail, uh, gangbangers, all that stuff. So it really, it really opened my eyes to different cultures and respecting different cultures and, and really going through the ranks in football and track and field, you know, I, I always had uh, a, a really mutual respect for other races and different cultures like that. And it really helped me succeed once I got into the uh, college. And once I got into the NFL, because at my position, sometimes I was the only white guy in the room. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So I, I want to ask you about your college recruitment process. Obviously you went to Purdue and um, how, how many other offers that you had on the table and also did any other teams uh, per, like recruit you for another position or only safety and, what made you choose Purdue? Okay, that's a lot of stuff right there you just asked me. So be prepared here, okay? Uh, let, so see if I can remember everything, all right? So so uh, football-wise, I was a running back and a cornerback mm -hmm. since fourth grade. Going up until eighth grade, I couldn't play um, uh, running back because – quarterback running back and receivers there was a weight restriction it was like 140 and I was like 142 so I actually played tight end oh 
then going into high school, our high school was, it started in 89, two high schools combined. And it was more of a, <laughs> I, kind of the, the, um, the white sports were kind of the, you know, tennis, cross country, uh, soccer were kind of the, the sports that the school excelled at basketball, football, track and field. You know, they they had like won a dual track meet. Uh, they hadn't won a football game in many, many years. So my freshman year, a coach named Brett Forrester came in and really changed the program and, and brought in the Veer option. And I remember um, them wanting me to play quarterback. And I always thought, you know, the Darren, the Darren you know, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Prima Donna quarterbacks. I don't want nothing to do with a quarterback. You know what I'm saying? I'm not playing quarterback. Right. And it was like the first practice and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm watching the guys who are playing quarterback and I'm going, hmm. well, I'm like, I don't like this. I said, you know what? I have to depend on them to get me the ball. And I'm sitting there going at quarterback. Hmm. I'm the first guy that gets it. Like I get to make the decision on what I want to do with it. So, so in high school, I was, I was probably more of an offensive player. Um, even though I still played, I wasn't ever off the field uh punt returns kick returns i i thought this uh you know again growing up it was it was hard work you know you 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 get things done by by outworking the guy you know i mean nothing was ever handed to you uh never nothing there was nothing expected um again i grew up again my mother worked so i i was you know i took care of my own homework uh, cooked my own meals uh did my own laundry i mean it was just it was just how i was it made me very independent and I had a, I had a um, kind of a, a mindset of if it's going to be, it's up to me. So I wasn't waiting for anyone else to make the play. I was going to do it. Right. You know what I mean? I, I wanted to be the best at that position. And with that, um, again, with that, you know, trying to be the best at, at that every position, you put yourself out in front and you kind of become an automatic leader. Um, so. I always thought this, I was considered, I thought for myself, I was the best football player. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, you know what, if I'm not on the field, is my team as good as, it, as good as it can be? Well, no, it's not. So I never wanted to be off the field. And plus you practice all year round, you know, and you're hitting me, but the game's the fun part, man. That's where you make plays and get your name in the paper right. and get recruited. I mean, the name of the game is, is, is getting your name in the paper and, and, and scoring touchdowns and getting interceptions and making big plays and big time games. So I never wanted to go off the field. I wanted to make every single play I could. So um, I ended up, you know, leading in, in, in my senior year, we won our first conference championship. I led the league in rushing. I had 26 rushing touchdowns. Um, I think I rushed for like 1700 yards threw for like 700 yards and like five touchdowns. We went eight and one first time our school had ever won the conference championship. Uh, I was league MVP and this was a league, the Saginaw Valley league back then you had the Midland high Midland Dow who always had good teams. You had basically central basically Western. You had Saginaw, Saginaw heritage, Saginaw high where, Lamar Woodley, Draymond Green, Charles oh. Rogers. Um, um, they had, I mean, on that senior team, Saginaw High had 26 oh. college football players, 10 NFL players, an NBA player, three Super Bowl champions. Hmm. Arthur Hill is where Jason Richardson came from, yeah. Cliff Ryan. Um, so there was, I want to say, my senior, and then the Flint schools, Flint Northwestern, Flint Southwestern, Flint uh, Northern. Flint Central. These, I don't know if you remember um, the Michigan State back in 2000 when they won the national championship for basketball, mm-hmm. the Flintstones. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, th- those are all the schools that, that they came from the schools that I played. So it was, wow. there was like 76 college athletes in that league. And I was, I was the MVP of that league. Um, so the thing that really got me into the recruiting aspect of it was, mm-hmm. again, a guy named Charles Rogers. Mm-hmm. And Charles Rogers was the best natural athlete that I've ever played against. Hmm. And, you know, and I, I've played, I've played with and against Randy Moss, Jerry Rice, Tim Brown, um, Charles Woodson, Nandi Asikamwa, Fabian Washington, Broadway. you know, with Dean Thompson and these guys. And Charles Rogers was the best natural athlete. He could do anything. 
Um, And we started in freshman year at 14 years old on football, basketball, and track. We were just battling each other. And he didn't want me to beat him, and I didn't want him to beat me. So we were constantly – we were constantly challenging each other and it really, it, it brought a town together. Um, you know, you had 95% of the white population on my side. You had 95% of the black population on Charles's side. So as a sophomore, Charles Rogers really blew up. He won this, the hundred meter dash as a sophomore, blew everybody away. Um, did had a very good football season. So there was, he brought in a lot of the, the coaches like Barry Alvarez and, and Nick Saban and, and Lloyd Carr and Joe Tiller and Bob Davies. And um, I mean, everybody was coming in. Right. So what really, what really kind of opened up the recruiting eyes is because again, it's just natural that six foot three, 200 pound white kid from the Midwest. He's going to be smart. Mm-hmm going to be a good locker room guy right good leader but he's not going to be that fast he's not going to be that athletic hmm. so how do you how do you how do you get the coaches to to, to even on the field even if you're running past people they still right. just don't think you have that speed so my junior year in track um in the state championship i beat charles rogers in the 100 meter dash hmm. and it was the first time a white guy had won it since 1956 and i set a state record it was a 10 6 0 AccuTrack time, which would be like a 10 3 2 handout time. So when that happened, it would literally be like a white guy beating Usain Bolt. Like, like there, we, we would have six or 7,000 people to come watch us run a dual track meet. Hmm. So when that happened, it was like, holy smokes, this guy. That's one thing that's great about track. I always encourage guys to run track because. People see those track times and it's legit. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, and it's an instant credibility maker on guys, this guy's speed. And when I did that, I, I just shot through the roof. Um, I mean, we, <laughs> back in our day, they, we didn't have all of these, you know, uh, recruiting services, right? You had Tom Lemming and you had, you had super prep and wow. you actually had to go to the store and like buy this and they would come out with rankings. Hmm. So I was ranked um, as far as super prep national 50, like the top 50 players in the country. I was ranked 34, uh, the 34th best player in the country. And then my position, because I played quarterback and safety, I was considered an athlete Hmm. because some schools were recruiting me as receiver. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Bob Davies at Notre Dame, uh, Cam Cameron at Indiana. I can't remember the coach at um, Syracuse, but Nebraska, they wanted me to be quarterback. Hmm. Wisconsin receiver, Michigan State receiver. Purdue was kind of the first school to really have have the idea of me kind of playing both. Um, but I was ended up being ranked uh, in, as the number two best athlete in the country. But a lot of it had to do with me competing against Charles Rogers and competing against the Saginaw High team that – so. We finished the season eight and one and Saginaw High's football team, the team I told you with 26 college athletes on 10 NFL guys. um, We beat them 34 to 12 in the regular season. We played them in the second round of the playoffs. They ended up beating us. And then they walked through and won the state championship. Hmm. So playing against the best comp. I mean, that's, that's the thing too, is, is you might have guys putting up stats. I see these guys highlight films, but, don't get so caught up in the guy that's do make it look at his competition. Like who is he playing against? Right. You know what I mean? Like if you look at the guys I'm playing, I'm playing against guys who were, you know, won Super Bowls and, and, and played all big 10 and all this type of stuff. So that again, if you're able to compete w- against those guys, again, it, it just, it just proves that, Hey, I think he's got what it takes to be at the next level. And Michigan gave me my first scholarship. Hmm. Um, I really liked Nick Saban. You know, Nick Saban, when I went to these spring games and, and, and visits to universities, most of the time the head coach is with the offense. You know, defensively, you're really – your head coach is a defensive coordinator. I mean, you never see the, the, the head coach messing with the defense. And all of a sudden I go to Michigan State, and not only is Nick Saban on the defensive side of the ball, but he's specifically working with the defensive backs. 
because he had come from Cleveland. He coached the defensive backs in Cleveland for the Browns for four years. Right. So I'm looking at this going, holy smokes. And this guy, this guy is showing serious interest. I mean, we went down to a Nick Saban football camp. It was a day camp. And literally Nick Saban spent from nine o'clock until 10 o'clock. He picked my dad up in the golf cart and gave him a private tour of Michigan State. They went to his house. They hung out. And my dad said, you know, this guy really wants you. Um, but then he left to go to LSU, first first coach to sign a million-dollar contract. And then Joe Tiller and Brock Spack and Jim Chaney. Brock Spack's the defensive coordinator, now the head coach at Illinois State. Jim Chaney, offensive coordinator. Now I want to say he's with the – he's with the NFL team doing something, I think. Um, and then Joe Tiller. And they just had – they just – I went to Wisconsin, Notre Dame, uh, Wisconsin, Notre Dame, Michigan State, and Purdue for my official visits. Mm -hmm. And I did them back to back to back to back, and they're all in bowl practices. And Notre Dame, Wisconsin, and Michigan State, it just seemed like they were at practice. The guys were just like, uh. when mm -hmm. I went to Purdue, man, you know, Joe Tiller's messing with Drew Brees and – Brock Spack's messing with Aiken Adel. And I mean, they, <laughs> it was like this team on the rise. And, and I just felt they were the most honest. I, I felt I could make my mark down there. I felt I could play there the fastest. And they had a game plan for me. They sat me down. They said, here's five plays on offense. We said, they had a video. Here's five plays on offense. But we see you doing five plays on defense and five plays on special teams. And then I started letting people, like the word got out that, Purdue did this and all the other schools going, well, you can do that here too. And I'm like, well, you know what? You didn't, you didn't come up with the idea. Right. Purdue did. And Joe Tiller was just, when he walked in, it was like your grandfather, you know? And I just felt that obviously Purdue is a great education, right? I mean, you can't beat Purdue university um, as far as big 10 schools go, maybe Northwestern. Yeah. And um, <laughs> he comes on his, so you get, you know, you get one like coach's home visit. Uh, maybe he gets 15 a whole year, right? So you got to think Joe Tiller, Purdue, is coming up to Michigan to recruit the number two athlete in the state when you when Michigan just won the national championship. Mm -hmm. Nick Saban's going to the Orange Bowl with, with um, Michigan State. You're thinking you're wasting your time, you mm -hmm. know? And Brock's back talking to my parents, and Joe Tiller's just sitting there looking at me. He's not saying anything. I'm going, wow. <laughs> I'm kind of like, well, okay. And I said, coach, what, what's up? He goes, he goes, God, you got a big nose. <laughs> he goes, geez, you got a big nose too. I'm going, really? That's what you've been sitting there. And he goes, how does that thing fit in that helmet? How do you get your helmet on with that big nose? Hmm. And I, I'm like, that's just how he was though. Like he was, he was a great coach because he got a great staff around him. He hired, he hired coaches who were, who knew more than him. And that the good coaches do that. Right. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of good coaches out there. That's why you see the same coaches winning bad coaches. What a lot of coaches do is it's they're, they're, they're so their egos, they're just, they need to have control of everything. So they hire people around them that know less so they can control them. Hmm. Well, Joe Tiller had, had, had a phenomenal staff. The other thing about Joe Tiller was, his graduation rate for football players was like 94% of the football players graduated. We were always higher than the, than the regular student population. Wow. He said, if your child's coming to this university, we're going to make sure that he gets a degree. And every time I talked to him after I was done, he never talked about football. He wanted to know how life was and, and how my family was. And, um, you know, when he passed away, it was, it was tough for me and I was very honored to be able to go out to his funeral in, in, in Buffalo, Wyoming and be an honorable uh, or um, uh, an honorable Paul Bearer. Am I saying that right? An honorable Paul. Uh, hmm. You know what I'm saying, right? You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So it, 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 and if you look 97, go, go, just look at Purdue's, go to, go to anything before 97 and then go to anything after 2008. And it's not even close. There's mm -hmm. nothing. I mean, you're talking when Joe Tiller was here, 10 bowl games. Um, he, he, I mean, we're beating Michigan, Ohio State. I think we had, I mean, we had, I think during his time, like 70 NFL draft picks. I mean, Purdue at one point 
was the leading record holder for having 22 straight years of a, of a player in the Super Bowl. And he was just, he knew how to, he knew how to one, find, find the kid that could fit into Purdue, right? Academically. Yeah. But also fit into West Lafayette. Hmm. It's a different environment. Yeah. We can't get some of the same guys that Michigan State can and, and, and Wisconsin can. They just academically won't make it. And then some of these guys, they just won't fit in culturally, you know? So, and you got to really know how to, how to find those guys. And he knew how to do it. And, uh, you know, I met my wife here. Um, I graduated. I played four years. I was the Big Ten freshman of the year. Drew Brees was my quarterback my, my, oh. my freshman year. I was a true freshman. I led the team in tackles, interceptions. Uh, we went to the Rose Bowl, hadn't gone since 1967. Hmm. Um, I was Big Ten three years in a row, Playboy All-American. I, I, the the uh, interception record at Purdue was 11 held by Rod Woodson. I tied that my sophomore year and ended up breaking it with 17. I have the record, 17 career receptions. Wow. I'm second all-time for DBs with tackles. I think I'm sixth all-time bar position with tackles. Met my wife here, who was an All-American hurdler, Chrissy. Oh wow! And uh, that's why we moved back here, man. It's it's a it's a great great community, and um, so hopefully, hopefully I, hopefully I answered your question. But I did get, I did get recruited by other positions. Yeah. But I thought, I thought this too because my dad coming out of South Dakota, there's no pro teams there, so or uh, really big colleges or pro teams. So Minnesota Vikings was his pro team, and then Notre Dame was his college team. And I remember when we, you, get, you just got to pull some, you got to get guys off the list, right? Yeah. And I, I said, you know what, Notre Dame, we're taking off. And I says, whoa, 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 hey, 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 son, hey, hey. You could be the starting quarterback for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. You know that, right? And I said, yes, dad. But I said, option quarterbacks, what do they do when they go in the NFL? They either become a receiver or DB. And I said, I just, I'd rather make that switch now. Wow. So there you go. Hmm, that's, that's a great, uh, crazy recruiting process for you there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we got 20 more minutes left uh, for your uh, dog. Oh, yeah. What else? yeah. So we're going to, so, so we usually do this fun little segment. It's called the rapid fire segment. We usually do it at the end, but we're going to do it now. So, uh, so you ready for this rapid fire? You segment? said rap, rapid fire? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to ask you. So obviously, your draft experience was interesting because the first uh, the first thing I want to ask you is uh, your combine real quick because um, that's where you killed you killed the combine. Uh, you did great at the combine. Mike 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 Mayock was your basically broke down your film and what was that like? And do you do you do you still talk to him after since he's a GM now with the Raiders? Well, you know what I when I went out for the reunion three weeks ago, he he had COVID, so oh. he was on quarantine, and that in 2004 was the first time that the NFL combine was televised. So I think I thought that everybody, if, unless they have an injury and there's a specific reason they can't perform should perform at the count at the combine, because it is four days of hell. And you don't do, you don't, you, do, you don't do the, the testing until the last day. Right. I mean, you're, you're in meetings and, 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 um, um, test with doctors and, and getting scans and then uh, doing the bench press test and the wonder look test and then uh, psychological tests. And to be able to perform under those conditions, I think is, is pivotal. And again, here you go coming in. Everyone questioned my speed, right? Everyone questioned my speed, which I don't really understand how, when I beat Charles Rogers, who was the number two draft pick in the 2003 draft. This is the next year. And I'm thinking all the, all the recruit, all the, all the um, studying that you guys do, you guys didn't know that. Like, so again, I'm, I'm sitting in a, and in the evenings you have 15 minutes where a horn blows and you have a card and it says, okay, eight, eight o'clock Detroit Lions, eight fifteen Jacksonville Jaguars, um, eight thirty Atlanta Falcons. And you walk into the room and it's, it's a chair just like this. And then sitting across here is the entire coaching staff, GMs, owners, everyone just, and they're just bing, 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 bing. And I'm sitting there and Steve Mariucci is asking me, 
hey, you think you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna break four six tomorrow? And I'm sitting here going, and I'm looking. I'm like, you talk, are you talking to me? I'm like, I haven't ran four six since probably seventh grade. I'm gonna break four five. And, and they all kind of looked at me, but I'm thinking. The guy that you drafted number two overall last year, I beat him, right? But anyways, so I ran a real, I ran a 444, a 40 at 63, 218. Um, I ran a 391, 510, 5 shuttle. I ran the fastest L drill there at a six, I can't remember what it was, uh, 38 and a half inch vertical. Um, and I graded out, I actually have it. Um, I graded out as an A oh, at wow. the combine. So it, it, again, I, but that's the thing. I didn't have the luxury of them just saying, Hey, he's an athlete. Cause again, first of all, I'm coming from Michigan, white kid, big white kid, tough, slow. Then I'm at Purdue, you know, smart kid, white kid, slow, you know, not athletic. So it was like, but you know what? I, I always before I liked I liked performing under pressure. And and um I trained at Athletes Performance Institute Institute, Mark Verstegen out in Scottsdale, Arizona for six weeks before the combine and amazing trainers out there. And yeah, I did I did really, really, really well in the combine. And I it's it's tough to put mine if you look at it overall, even now there's not guys that had the numbers I did. Hmm. Wow. So uh, what would you say? Uh Obviously, you got drafted by the Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders. What would you say uh, your best moment in your NFL career was and, and, and in Purdue, both NFL and Purdue? Oh, okay. Um, my freshman year, it was like the third game where we're playing Notre Dame at Notre Dame, and that's a huge rivalry for us. You know, in-state rivalry is a trophy game, so we have three trophy games. The Shillelagh against Notre Dame, the cannon against Illinois and the old open bucket against Indiana. Hmm. And we're up there and I, I broke my hand in training camp. So I, I played the first six games my freshman year with a cast on my hand and the starting safety got hurt. So I go in the game and have a really good game and Notre Dame's driving. I have my first interception on national TV to get the ball back in Drew Brees' hands to have him drive down and score. Now, Nick said it comes down and kicks like an 80 yard field goal and beats us, but that was a great moment for me. And then, my probably the last game of the year against Indiana that freshman year to win the Big Ten championship. Again, another rivalry game. Antoine Randall L., great, great quarterback. My freshman year, again, I picked him off twice um, to help seal the, 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 the victory and, and, take us into the Rose Bowl. So that was a great moment. When I broke the all-time interception record at Purdue was a great moment. Um, my last play in ross Aid Stadium was an interception against Iowa with my grandparents there. And I want to say we were like 12th in the country. Iowa was like 10, so it was a huge game for us. And then in the NFL, obviously being drafted. Mm -hmm. uh, my first interception as a pro um, against the Miami Dolphins. And... Um, just you know the the relationships with with my teammates and stuff was very special and getting to getting to know al davis and in the organization and um a lot of i mean i had a lot of good moments though in, in oakland unfortunately our offenses weren't very good they were very very bad right. so no one no one thought anybody out there was good but our defenses in 2006 for instance I was on the number one pass defense. Wow. We had the number one pass defense. We had the number three overall defense. I finished second in the NFL for safeties with 109 tackles. And we finished two and 14. Our offense was just hmm. dead last, like in every category. So we didn't get any of the Monday night games. You know, I played under three, three different head coaches in four years. And it's just, it's tough to be successful uh, in that environment. Yeah. So speaking of the offense. Well, not, not successful, but it's tough to get the recognition. Right. Hmm. So speaking of the offense, um, I had one of your four former teammates on recently, yeah. Gabriel, uh, on the show, and uh, that was a great honor to talk to. What a great receiver he was in the league. And what was it like playing with him? And also, your defense, you had Rod Woodson, Charles Woodson, Nandi Asma, Warren Sapp. Uh, you, yep. I can go down the roster, and it's amazing, talented roster. So what was that like playing with those type of players? For you? you know what? I, I was very fortunate with, uh, I mean, Rich Gannon, 
Kerry yeah. Collins, Dante Culpepper, uh, um, Tyrone Wheatley, Zach Crockett, uh, Warren Sapp, mm -hmm. Derek Burgess, Jerry Porter, Jerry Rice, Tim Brown, Randy yeah. Moss, yep. Jamarcus Russell, <laughs> um, Kirk Morrison, Michael Huff, Fabian Washington, Stanford Rout, um, gosh, uh, Ronaldo Hill, who's now the defensive coordinator for the LA Rams, who's a Michigan State guy. Uh, Gerard Cooper, Chris Carr. I mean, it's just we had talent everywhere, but we just didn't – we couldn't get the coaches in there that could get everyone on the same page offensively. Uh, but Doug Gabriel was uh, – oh, Justin Fargus was, was a great competitor, uh, tough – one of the toughest running backs I've went against. Doug Gabriel was, was, was a guy that, you know, came out of a, a – at then U, UCF – UCF? You no, know, USF wasn't as, you know – it was starting to be on the rise, you know? So really he was kind of an unknown guy, but big guy, big receiver, physical, fast, tough, good hands, played special teams. Ron Curry. That's another guy that was on there. A great athlete. Um, so uh, Doug, Doug's still a close friend of mine. I actually spoke to Doug yesterday. I was going through and I've been going through and, and, and I have a ton of media stuff, you know, old films and everything. I found some old pictures of us when we played, in the 2006 Hall of Fame game against the Philadelphia Eagles. And I had pictures of, of me um, with, with Willie Brown and um, um, Art Shell and Jackie Slater and Doug Gabriels and some of those. So I sent them those pictures or whatever. But the Raiders are doing a phenomenal job of the alumni thing. And, and yeah. Doug kind of got me back involved with the Raiders. And what Mark, Mark Davis is doing is, is that's absolutely amazing. And for instance, this – this Sunday or this Monday, they're flying me out back to Vegas. I'm going to go to the, the Las Vegas Aces WNBA game. That's at Mark owns them as well. Sign autographs, talk to the suite holders, then go to the Monday night game against the Baltimore Ravens and go into the suites and, and be considered. Uh, actually, they sent me this shirt, which is, which is really, really cool. They're, they're really big. I mean, this is, this is what I'm, Oh, this wow. is what I'm wearing here is, is oh, that's nice. alumni, you know, yeah. and that's like, they, they, they say once a Raider, always a Raider, yeah. Raider. And you think, yeah, whatever. So <laughs> I go, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a Raider? They said, this is how Mark Davis considers you a Raider. If you, in, in a, in a regular season game, if you play one snap in a Raiders uniform, you are considered a Raiders for life. And it, they really mean it. I mean, there's 120 guys uh, four weeks ago that went out there and they're like, they're saving people's lives. They're saving my life by bringing it back into my life. So it's, it's very special. And Doug's a guy that really got me back involved. So I have a lot of respect for Doug and his family. And it's great to get to back to meet with some of these guys. Yeah. That's what Doug told me, even though he played with different teams, he's, he's told me that he's a Raider for life. So. Oh, what am I thinking? Charles Woodson. Like, yeah, Jesus. Charles. I mean, come on, man. Like coming from Michigan. That was the one player that when I got to Oakland, I was a little starstruck, you know, coming from Michigan and during that 97 season, him winning the Heisman. I mean, like Charles Woodson is, oh, well, Ray Buchanan is, a, is, a, is a, a guy that was my mentor when I was a rookie, really taught me how to be a professional off the field. And I reconnected with him now that I'm back with the Raiders and his son, uh, Jordan Buchanan, Last week, just verbally committed to Purdue. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm super, 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 super pumped. But I'm like, this is – for 15 years, I didn't have any association with the Raiders. I Because you leave on bad terms and you think, you know, they fired me. I didn't do what I needed to do. Like, they don't want nothing to do with me, and they really do. I mean, they're the only – they're they're kind of trailblazing this whole thing in the NFL, and it's, it's, it's amazing. Wow. So um, who are some of the safe, safeties now in today's game that remind you of yourself? Uh, you, well, okay. Well, here's the thing again, you know, your coach, the, the coach that you had on your last show yeah. or a couple shows ago talked about mental health and stuff. And, you know, I, I've had, I, I've, I've been in, uh, I, I had a workers comp claim in California, the NFL concussion lawsuit. Oh, gee, sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Sorry. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I've seen over 50 doctors, you know, I've been dealing with mental health the last eight years. My prefrontal cortex is damaged. I had over 50 to 60 concussions, uh, during my playing time. 
Um, so what was I, uh, where was I going with that? Hmm. What were we talking about? Oh, I, I asked, uh, who are uh, some of the safety? Oh. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so when I left the NFL, I couldn't watch the NFL. Oh, okay. I, I, I have PTSD from it. I would get anxious. I just, whatever. So I'm finally now getting back into it. And um, so I don't, I don't know the safeties well enough to even give an opinion. Um, what time is it, sweetie? Oh, it's one fifty. No, it's twelve fifty. Jeez. All right, so you will leave in five minutes, okay? Um, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm expecting a lot of things out of Abrams this year from Oakland. I mean, that defense is really. We need some big things from him. Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for uh, Smith in Minnesota. Oh, okay. You know, wow. Notre Dame guy. Yeah. Um. He plays well. Obviously, Mathau, Matt Mathau. Oh, Tyra, Tyra Matthew. Yeah, even though I hate Kansas City, I can't stand them. Um, there's a guy, Brian Cole, who actually I trained uh, since he was in sixth grade. Went, went, he's from Saginaw, went to my middle school and high school, uh, played at Mississippi State, got drafted by the Vikings, and he was – the last I knew he was with the um, uh, Carolina Panthers, and he could be a heck of a safety. Uh, but I – uh, uh, do you remember the guy Heath, Jeff Heath? Yeah, that Jeff played Heath. for the Cowboys, then yeah. for Oakland. He's actually from the Saginaw. He's from the Detroit area and played at Saginaw Valley State. Um, but I haven't watched it enough. But yeah. to be honest with you, it's just a different game. Mm-hmm. These, these guys, these safeties can't – they can't come up and make the hits and that type of stuff like they used to be able to do. So it's really hard to even compare guys from my era to guys now because it's just completely different. Yeah, so so before I let you go, uh, last two things here real quick. Um, our team is part of this foundation. It's called the Hugh Jackson Foundation. He's a former NFL coach. Um, now he's an offensive coordinator at Tennessee State with Eddie George, and we're trying to help him prevent human trafficking, making sure the community stays safe. So I'll send it to you so you can check it out. Wait, you're going to send me like a link to it or something? Yeah, the Hugh Jackson Foundation. Oh, okay, yeah. cool, cool. And the last thing here, um, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, and essential workers right now? Well, you know, my wife's a nurse. Um, she's uh, been in healthcare. Uh, she's done on, she's, she's, a, she's an oncology nurse. She's also done cardiology. She's done um, uh, emergency room. Um, obviously during this time, um, you know, they, they can't, they can't find people who want to work and the people who are working are working double shifts and um, you know, health workers. Um, we, we, <laughs> We obviously we need them, right? I mean, they're they're the ones that are, are are saving us from a lot. I mean, I've seen so many different doctors, and to have some good ones, I mean, it, it, it's a difference maker. So, um, you know, I just encourage anyone who's out there. I want to say thank you for their services, and you know, hopefully, some of these people who are dragging their feet, not wanting to work, can come back and help lighten the load. And um, you know, because we need we need healthcare workers more than we need anything right now. So, um, so yeah, I I, I high hold healthcare workers and nurses in high regard because my wife is one and a lot of her family, her, 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 her actual grandmother, my kid's great grandmother was a nurse as well. Wow. Yeah. Tell your wife, I said, thank you for her service. I will. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And uh, well said. And I want to say thank you for bringing me on the show and I'm, I'd love to come back. Yeah. Yeah. We would love to have you back on the show and uh, so you can meet the full team uh, eventually here. And uh, thank you again for coming on. This wraps up big episode 900 with former NFL safety, former Purdue safety, uh, Stuart Schweiger. Go follow him on all social media formats. Uh, once a Raider, always a Raider for him. Yep. And <laughs> So thank you again. Uh, this was an honor. I learned a lot from this. And uh, keep up the great work, man. And uh, and also thank you for the prayers for our friend Susie. Um, so oh, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm dedicating this episode to her uh, in memory of her. So uh, thank oh, you. Oh, and shout out to, shout out to um, uh, 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 gosh, um, uh oh. oh geez i'm i'm gonna be bad here um she was just we were just talking to her on twitter oh amy trash amy trash amy yeah, yes yeah. yes she's oh, a very she's amazing she is the best she she is she is a a, a, a beautiful woman she is a boss she is a, a great business mind came up from from just working up her way up in the raiders organization man yeah. she is she is awesome and i've always had the highest respect for her and it was great to reconnect with her because i've been trying to get back with her now yeah, so that was actually, great. funny story here real quick uh before we uh end this um so i we we had her on the show 
Uh, oh, really? I, yeah, a couple of months. But I'll send you the interview so you can check it out. So, oh, cool. Um, yeah, she's amazing. We connected on Twitter for a while. We've been talking back and forth. She always sees my stuff. She's really supportive. Speaking of women in sports, she's a, there is an example for everyone out there. Amy Trask. What an amazing, powerful woman out there right now. Amazing. And yeah, what do you, I mean, you're talking about someone that made it up through yeah. – the Raiders organization, when you're talking about some tough men and Al Davis and man, and she's just a little thing, dude. And she, she started from literally the bottom of that organization and worked her way up to the freaking top. Yeah. But thank you again, man. This is, uh, this has been uh, awesome. All right. Hey, thank you very much.